They were described as psychopaths who shot people for fun. The leaders of Manchester's most notorious gun gang. I can't underestimate the threat that these two individuals pose. Money, drugs, guns, give them respect. That's what they demand. <laughs> This is the exclusive story of how a specialist police team took down the leaders of a feared criminal gang who brought murder and mayhem to the streets of one of Britain's biggest cities. I've been investigating the criminal activity of the South Manchester gangs now for over 20 years. Colin Joyce and Lee Amos are the most ruthless criminals that I've ever investigated. is Manchester, a city famous for its football teams and its music scene. But it's also earned a less welcome reputation for gun crime. In the past few years, Manchester has been blighted by weapons and by gangs. But a police investigation has transformed this city and smashed the gun culture. The investigation would lead to a remarkable trial. The most severe sentences in Manchester gangland history. And a unique and controversial publicity campaign. This is the story of how Greater Manchester Police brought down the Gooch Gang. Rod Carter is part of Greater Manchester Police's specialist Excalibur unit set up in 2004 to tackle Manchester's gangs, many of which operate in the inner city area of Moss Side. Excalibur was needed because too many young people were dying on the streets. OK, we're on uh, Westwood Street in Moss Side now. It's been a, a hive of gang activity over the years, just at the junction here. Uh, a man by the name of Raymond Pitt was sat in his car uh, when he was shot and killed. As we come out at the end of Westwood Street, uh, on the right-hand side is Broadfield Park, where uh, uh, Jesse James, a 15-year-old schoolboy, was, uh, was shot and killed. If you look to your left, you'll see Alvino's takeaway, where Benji Stanley, another schoolboy, uh, was shot and killed. Justin Maynard um, was shot just on the left-hand side here. Gun crime became so commonplace in Manchester that the city was given a new name by the press. These were violent streets where hooded gang members began wearing body armour under their tracksuits and gang battles were fought out on hospital corridors. I can remember uh, speaking to a gang member who was 14 years of age and he told me that he'd taken every drug that, that you could think of and nothing gave him a high like shooting somebody. Much of the conflict centred around the Alexandra Park estate in Moss Side. The west of the estate was the turf of the Gooch Gang, centred around Gooch Close, which was to become one of the most notorious streets in Britain. The Gooch Gang's bitter rivals were the Doddington from the other side of the estate. Uh, for about 18 months, both groups coexisted uh, quite peacefully, really. Um, but there was a shooting in uh, March 1991, and since then there's been in excess of two dozen murders. The violence presented Greater Manchester Police with the biggest challenge they'd ever faced. Detective Chief Inspector Steve Eckersley was the man assigned to bring the gangs down. The arrival between the South Manchester gangs has been a significant problem for Manchester for over 20 years. 
They are involved in tit-for-tat shootings, serious woundings and homicides of mainly young black males. Top of the list of targets was the Gooch Gang. Colin Joyce and Lee Amos were the gang's self-styled generals. They were involved in the criminal use of firearms, gang homicides and the distribution of Class A drugs which includes heroin and cocaine. They were prepared to use firearms in public areas to murder rival gang members. American law enforcement agencies refer to uh, gang members as being impact players and followers uh, and I think there's little doubt that uh, Amos and Joyce were certainly the most impactive players um, involved in the South Manchester gang scene. To speak to them both, they were both quite different characters. Um, Amos always appeared calm and confident. Amos certainly had a reputation around the Moss side and alongside areas and uh, he's uh, able to commit acts that most of us would find abhorrent and uh, just be able to walk away from them and carry on as normal. Colin Joyce was a manipulator and it appeared that quite a few of the other gang members who were not as high up within the hierarchy as him uh, would do things to try and impress him. Both Joyce and Amos had been convicted of firearms offences. The police executed a warrant at uh, a safe house in Moss Side and in that premises they found uh, a Scorpion submachine gun capable of discharging over a thousand rounds per minute. They were both found to be wearing uh, jeans that had had the pockets adapted um, so that they could uh, fit firearms in them, um, which I think is an indication of the, of the kind of individuals you're dealing with. Joyce and Amos received nine-year sentences, but both were released early on licence. This is Colin Joyce filmed on the day he left prison. Once on the outside, he quickly regained control of a fearsome gang of thugs and criminals. Yo. This is never-before-seen footage taken at a party attended by members of the Gooch gang. Although Joyce and Amos weren't present, their key lieutenants were. Wrapping it up. So cute, yeah. This is Hassan Shah, who handled guns and supplied drugs. Ricky. Ricky. This is Jamaican-born Ricardo Rick Dog Williams, who was prepared to commit murder. And this is his brother, Narada Williams, known as Yardi, who was also ready to kill for the gang. Although they didn't know it, they were on a collision course with the police that would put many of them behind bars for decades. In the world of the Gooch gang, respect was demanded, and even the perception of being close to a rival gang could have deadly consequences. Yukal Chin was loosely associated with the Long Sight crew, an offshoot of the Doddington gang. But it was enough to make him an enemy of the Gooch. Yukal would be gunned down in a merciless attack. In a hospital bed, with blood all on his clothes. That's the last thing I've seen of my brother. Yukal's murder began what would be one of the most remarkable, complex and challenging investigations ever undertaken. Until recently, Yukal's killers may well have gone undetected, but dramatic advances in investigative techniques would enable police to hunt them down and take them off the streets. The case would rely on high-tech surveillance, DNA profiling, ballistic expertise and complex evidence from CCTV. This exact spot where the fatal shots were discharged and the actual point of where the murder took place was, has been caught on film.
Colin Joyce and Lee Amos were the leaders of the Gooch Gang, one of the most violent gangs Manchester has ever known. They were major players in a city famous for its gun crime, and police believed they had a score to settle. In 2002, Lee Amos's brother Stephen was killed by members of the Longsight crew, a faction of the Doddington gang. And investigators believed that both Joyce and Amos had vowed to avenge Stephen's death. Yukal Chin would be the first victim. Father of two young children, Yukal was loosely associated with the Longsight crew, but he was trying to move away from gang activity and turn his life around. He didn't get the chance. Just before 7pm on Friday, the 15th of June 2007, Yukal Chin was driving a red Renault Megane towards the city centre along Anson Road, Longsight. Seconds after he passed through the junction with Dickinson Road, a silver Audi S8 pulled up alongside the vehicle and discharged seven shots into the Red Megane. Four of those shots struck Yukal Chin and he was fatally wounded. I was in work and then I saw him with his girlfriend phone and said, they shoot Yukal. And then the second time they phone, I said, don't tell me, don't tell me, because it... <laughs> Because I know the second time what they was going to say, say you could die. And... <laughs> The shooting took place on a busy main road in broad daylight and a massive police investigation began, led by Detective Chief Inspector Janet Hudson. We had no witnesses who'd seen the identity of the person who pulled the trigger or a driver. We didn't get the full registration number of the vehicle. Um, we didn't recover the gun from, the, from this incident. So when you start to break it down to how am I going to detect this job, it's very difficult. The police may not have found the murder weapon, but they did recover the bullets it fired. Ballistics experts at the Northern Firearms Unit got to work. Seven bullets were recovered from this scene, of which four were determined to have hit Ukal Chin. Experts suspected that the bullets had been fired from a Russian-made Baikal pistol, in order to confirm this, they test-fired a similar weapon. Firing! Firing! One bullet from the murder scene was examined alongside another one recovered from the test and the rifling marks left as the projectile leaves the barrel were compared. They matched completely. This confirmed that the rifling marks were from a bicycle. The murder weapon that had been used to assassinate Yukal Chin was one that the Gooch gang were very familiar with. In 2007, the bicycle was the weapon of choice by the Gooch gang. It was a weapon that was readily available and they could be purchased for a couple of hundred pounds. Detectives now knew the type of gun used in the murder and the fact that this was a popular weapon with the Gooch gang. They were also making progress in another key area. Closed circuit television systems did not exist 40 years ago, but now they are a vital weapon in the fight against serious crime. In Manchester, hundreds of cameras were recording around the time of the shooting, and some of them revealed in dramatic detail how the murder unfolded. We 
we established that around 30 minutes prior to the murder, Ukil had been driving through Eleven Zoom together with his friends. Several cameras picked up the red Renault Megane as it cruised through the city. Cameras also capture the silver Audi cruising the same areas. Police intelligence would later prove that Colin Joyce was inside the Audi. At 6.46 p.m., this bus camera picks up the Megane. As the footage continues, the silver Audi appears. Just a few other vehicles separate the two cars. We are now on a countdown to murder. The silver Audi was probably looking for an opportune moment to carry out the execution. Minutes later, a CCTV camera clearly shows the Audi directly behind the Megane. In just a few seconds, Yukal Chin would be dead. Amazingly, the point at which both vehicles were uh, alongside each other was captured by uh, a CCTV camera from the premises just across the road there, uh, and the actual point of where the murder took place was, uh, has been caught on film. Here you can clearly see the silver Audi draw directly parallel with the Megane, and it was now that the occupants opened fire. UCAL's car finally came to rest against the telephone exchange box behind me here. Uh, and again, this was caught on CCTV from a bus that was passing. On the left of the footage, a crowd can be seen gathering around the crashed Megane. But it was too late to save UCAL Chin. When I go into Asperger's, he was laying on the bed. I see his feet as reaching. And I was dead there over him, hugging him and they crying. My mum was trying to wake him up. I'm like, you can't wake him up, mum. But she was still shaking him. The doctors were like, he's not getting up. And that was the last time I seen him. Yukal's killers had raced away from the scene of the attack, but CCTV cameras were once again able to track the vehicle. We knew which way the vehicle had gone following the shooting from witnesses. We picked up snippets of the vehicle and were eventually able to plot it right across Manchester city centre, right the way up into Cheatham Hill for about 30 minutes. At this point, the car disappeared from sight and police believe it was probably taken to a breaker's yard and scrapped. However, there was an important breakthrough. A member of the public wrote down part of the yeah, car registration number, which was absolutely vital for us, because using the police national database for vehicles, we were able to confirm the registration number of that vehicle. The police national computer, or PNC as it's commonly referred to, has become a crucial online aid to criminal investigations. Advances in technology now allow police to search for vehicles using only a partial number plate. And the PNC managed to trace the silver Audi used in the attack. It had been purchased in Luton by members of the Gooch gang some five days prior to the attack and driven north from Luton to Manchester where it was stored in Cheatham Hill. Although Joyce and Amos were still officially under supervision by the authorities, in reality, they'd gone on the run. Six weeks after Yukal Chin's assassination, the Gooch gang were about to strike again. And this time, it would be an even more shocking crime. The fact that these individuals have attacked a funeral, um, I think it's unheard of, and I don't think not only in Manchester, but uh, in criminal history in the country. Yukal Chin was shot and killed in June 2007 as he drove his car through the streets of Manchester. Six weeks later, his family finally got to bury him. And in the evening, people began gathering outside Yukal's house for a wake, which would itself end in death. Among the mourners were several members of the Longsight crew and Doddington gangs. 
Colin Joyce and Lee Amos, the leaders of their bitter enemies, the Gooch Gang, knew they were there. I don't think there was any doubt that uh, both Lee Amos and Colin Joyce hated members of the, uh, the LSC and Doddington and those opposed to the Gooch. And the fact that there had been 80 to 90 people gathering in such a small location here, amongst which there would have been several gang members, um, was too much of a, a target for them to miss. Just before midnight, the Gooch gang made their move. Uh, two to three vehicles came on from this direction uh, and came towards the junction here, uh, where they stopped and shots were discharged into, into the group of people. There was people outside screaming and there's like they was pushing each other to come in the house and there was they say, they shoot Tyro and I said, no, no, not Tyro, not Tyro. Tyrone Gilbert was 24 and about to become a father for the fourth time. Tyrone was near the front of the close and received a fatal wound to his side. He actually managed to run down to the bottom of the close before he, before he collapsed and, and subsequently died from his injuries. Um, it's just amazing, really, that there weren't more fatalities with the amount of people that there were about. It says a lot to me that they could go past the wake and shoot into an open street with women and children. They were just unbiased in who they caught with these bullets. It's just a case of, I think it comes down to they've got no self-respect, so they have no respect for the life of other people. They have no value on life, so anyone's for the taking. Detectives now had a second drive-by shooting to investigate. And they needed to move quickly to prevent any more bloodshed. CCTV evidence would again prove vital. It showed the murder vehicles moving into position on the night of the shootings. You can only imagine what the adrenaline must have been like in those cars as they, as they came on to attack the funeral, knowing what they were going to do. The vehicles used in the murder included a Honda Legend and a blue Audi S4. Intelligence proved that both Lee Amos and Colin Joyce were together in the Blue Audi at the time of the murder of Tyrone Gilbert. Both vehicles fled the scene and the Audi was never seen again. But police did recover the Honda Legend. It had been abandoned two and a half miles away in Burnage. This is the car that the killers fled from, now stored in a police compound in Manchester. There's quite a significant amount of both ballistic and forensic evidence recovered. Uh, in fact, you can see in the door frame here uh, where a bullet has passed through, where one of the uh, assassins has been sat in the seat and, and discharged his weapon through the window. Uh, the vehicle itself had been uh, disguised somewhat by having the rear windows blacked out. Some of this material has been removed now uh, in an attempt to recover fingerprints. The rear window is still blacked out, however. Quite a lot of the evidence in, in, within the vehicle was key in uh, securing convictions on a, a number of the individuals who stood trial with Joyce and Amos. Police were about to get their next major breakthrough in the investigation. A balaclava was found snagged on barbed wire near the scene of the abandoned Honda legend. Officers now turned to forensic science in their efforts to solve the case. The Forensic Science Service assists over 120,000 police cases every year. Often it is a forensic scientist working diligently out of the spotlight who provides the crucial pieces of evidence in an investigation. And the recovered balaclava certainly held some secrets. Being a balaclava, there's a high likelihood of saliva being transferred from the person wearing the balaclava. We test for the presence of saliva using a test paper which will change colour from white to blue. The test takes about 30 minutes to complete. After the 30 minutes of the lapse we came back to examine and lo and behold there were traces of saliva around the mouthpiece. We then target the area where the saliva test is positive and we take samples of the fabric, we literally cut it out place it into small test tubes and apply water to extract the DNA that's present in the saliva. What 
we do is then spin that DNA down in a centrifuge to form a small pellet. The pellet extracted from the balaclava was sent off to be analysed at the National DNA Database in London. Set up in 1995, the database currently holds the records of around 5 million people. 30,000 samples are added to the database each month, taken from items recovered from crime scenes and police suspects. The DNA pellet came up with a match. Aaron Campbell was a prominent member of the Gooch Gang, with convictions for violence and drug-related offences. Aaron Campbell was arrested and interviewed by the police. He accepted that at some point he had worn the balaclava, but not that day and not in the Honda Legend. It became vital to prove that Campbell had worn the balaclava inside the car, and the forensic scientists were able to do just that. A tape lift produced fibres from the balaclava and samples were also lifted from the car. These are the fibres from the balaclava and these are the fibres recovered from the car seat. Minuscule identical microfibres were found on both samples, proving the balaclava had been inside the Honda Legend. To give some idea of the size of the fibres, the individual fibres are perhaps a 25th of the width of a human hair. The wearer DNA belonging to Aaron Campbell linked him to the balaclava. It also linked him to the Honda Legend. And as we know, the Honda Legend was linked to the drive-by shooting of Tyrone Gilbert. Forensics had tied the Gooch gang to another murder. Tyrone's death has devastated the family. Mum was a strong person, but... A mum shouldn't have to bury a son. The Gooch gang had destroyed another family. But cracks were starting to appear and the police were closing in. Ballistics experts were about to add to the weight of evidence mounting up against the gang. First, they were able to identify the murder weapon used to kill Tyrone Gilbert. This is the actual bullet that killed Tyrone, recovered during the post-mortem. Once again, microscopic analysis revealed its source. The bullet recovered from Tyrone Gilbert was fired from a revolver similar to this Colt revolver here. Other bullets recovered from the crime scene were proof of a second revolver being used. This is a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum revolver of the type used in the shooting. The Smith & Wesson revolver was recovered during the execution of a search warrant by police in South Manchester some months after the murder of Tyrone Gilbert. That weapon had been used in several previous shootings involving the Gooch gang. Colin Joyce and Lee Amos were on the run, but they and the rest of the Gooch gang were now having every aspect of their lives investigated by officers and police now found evidence linking Joyce and Amos to the second murder vehicle, the blue Audi S4. An exhaustive search had led to the discovery of a logbook at a garage in Stockport containing the registration of the blue Audi. The garage owner recalled two men using the initials P and C. Joyce and Amos's nicknames were Piggy and Cabo. 
The garage logbook also contained an entry of the letter P and the word Evo. And police had surveillance footage of Colin Joyce getting into and driving away a Mitsubishi Evo. They also obtained a photo from the same observation point taken by a suspicious neighbour just before the Tyrone Gilbert murder. The photo was of the blue Audi used in the killing. The evidence against Joyce, Amos and the rest of the Gooch gang was substantial and one by one they were all arrested. Tony Weatherly questioned both Joyce and Amos for three days. He cannot be identified as he's currently working on a covert operation. Colin Joyce he came over as a very chatty, very affable person, uh, very charming to a degree. Then as soon as the tapes go on, he then became very guarded and made no comments to every question put to him. These are the actual audio tapes from the police interviews. On the 15th of June this year, um, a male called uh, Yukul Chin was shot in Anson Road in Longsight. Um, what can you tell me about that? No comment. It was clearly put to him that this was a planned attack. He had seen Yukul Chin driving the vehicle and that he was responsible for pulling the trigger. His vehicle that he was driving was purposely run off the road. He was targeted. Why would he be targeted? Joyce was equally uncooperative when questioned about Tyrone Gilbert's murder. Were you in one of those vehicles at the time Tyrone Gilbert was shot? Do you know who was in those vehicles? Were you one of the gunmen? With Joyce remaining silent, police began interviewing Lee Amos. Would he crack under the pressure? What, if any, involvement did you have in the murder of Yukul Chin? Lee Amos just remained completely silent throughout the entire process. Uh, he sat and stared at a piece of paper on the desk for three days. Where were you at the time that Tyrone Gilbert was shot dead? There was no reaction from him at all, uh, no facial expression from him, um, other than at the point where I asked him to discuss with me the murder of his brother. I know that in 2002, in February 2002, you had uh, a brother, Stephen, who was shot and murdered in Ashton, the line. Is that correctly? At that point, there was a uh, reaction from him. He was clearly uncomfortable in discussing that with me. And we know, we have information, know, that you swore revenge upon those who were responsible. What can you tell us about that? But again, still made no comments when any questions put to him, refused to communicate whatsoever, um, and remained this disciplined person staring at the desk. Joyce and Amos's silence didn't help. They were both charged with murder. In an attempt to reduce the risk of witness intimidation, the decision was made to hold the trial 35 miles away at Liverpool Crown Court, and it would prove to be one of the most remarkable trials ever witnessed. Well, you couldn't write it, could you? You couldn't ever expect that that was actually going to happen. Colin Joyce, Lee Amos and nine other members of the Gooch gang were now awaiting trial for offences ranging from firearms possession to murder. But ensuring their convictions would, in itself, be a complex challenge. That's because convictions wouldn't be possible without witnesses, and witnesses in gang trials are very hard to come by. 
50,000 pages of evidence were scrutinised by a team of prosecution lawyers, but the most difficult task was persuading people to talk. Most witnesses go through a variety of emotions. You know, they start off feeling confident, then they feel a bit nervous, then they feel anxious, and it's almost like a, a process of worry. So we made a commitment to these witnesses that we would be with them throughout this trial and that we would be there basically 24 hours a day. Support ranged from going for a cup of tea with them, sitting with them, to full protected status where their identity has changed and they are, they are moved away. Whatever it was that they needed to help them through that stage. This group of people had already killed two people and um, you can't lose sight of that when you're protecting your witnesses. The most important witnesses were those who were closest to the gang. We heard evidence from people who'd been associating with the gang members for a period of four years. Some of them admitted their own criminality, the fact that they were engaged in gang activity, drug dealing, possession of firearms. One witness told police about gang members coming to their house, packaging drugs in their kitchen and passing around handguns. Another told how they had been asked to store the Honda Legend car in their garage in the days leading up to Tyrone Gilbert's murder and had later been ordered to burn the vehicle's documents in an attempt to destroy evidence. I think for some of these witnesses, what they did was life-changing. I think that some of the witnesses were stuck in um, a cycle of crime in which they were being used by the gang members and they couldn't get out of that cycle. The threat of witness intimidation was very real. One of the defendants managed to get hold of a mobile phone in his prison cell and telephoned one of the key witnesses and made a plea to him uh, not to give evidence. Narada Williams was the man who made the call. Amazingly, the witness managed to record the conversation. Between me and you, I can't take this prison no more. I've been in here a year, bro. And I can sentence me. I'm never going to come out, bro. I can't handle it. He was obviously um, shaken up by it because he believed that they knew where he was. Um, by the fact that he'd received the phone call. I remember him saying that he thought at one point they might be outside. Help us out, man. Help us out. I'm begging you. I ain't got nothing no more. I, I got nothing. Only thing that I can think of, and I know you're going to disagree with me, is just say, yo, I'll tell you the truth. I've been lying. You can't get thrown in pen. They can't throw you in pen. I'm telling you that now. They can't throw you in pen. Well, you couldn't write it, could you? You couldn't ever expect that that was actually going to happen. Um, and I've not spoken to that witness soon since, but he got through it. Despite the intimidation, the community had had enough. With witnesses now pledging to give evidence, dawn broke on the day that Greater Manchester Police had feared might never arrive. The trial of the Gooch gang began. In September 2008, a heavily guarded prison van set off from Manchester across the M62 to the Crown Court in Liverpool. We were concerned that gang members may try to effect their escape from custody. And that's why I introduced the high security and armed escort between the two cities. The convoy would become a familiar sight. The trial was to be the longest and the largest in the history of Greater Manchester Police. The trial itself was uh, like no other trial I'd ever attended. Uh, it lasted nearly six months, uh, and the twists and turns that, that went uh, on a day-to-day -day basis were unbelievable sometimes. The atmosphere was electric, I recall it very well. There was over a hundred people in the court itself. We had everything from anonymous witnesses to people whose voices were disguised, screens for many. We had covert routes in and out of the court. Um, we had all kinds of things in place. The gang caused upset from the start. They 
shouted abuse to witnesses, shouted stuff to the prosecution. They didn't have any respect. They love to see people acting weak around them. They like to feel the power. Every day is like something inside burning up. To see they just sit there laughing. It was like a playground for them. The intimidatory tactics failed. We went into the court and they started to read out the verdicts and the tension was palpable. I think it was count four or five that was actually the first murder count. Uh, and when that verdict came back, it was just a sense of relief that we'd actually done it. I recall looking at Joyce as the second murder verdict was returned and saw him mouth the words, are you happy now? I cried, just out of relief, really. Because there were moments where I thought they were going to get off. Colin Joyce was convicted of both murders. Lee Amos was convicted of Tyrone Gilbert's murder, but the jury failed to reach a verdict about his alleged involvement in the killing of Yukal Chin. Aaron Campbell, Narada Williams and Ricardo Williams were convicted of Tyrone Gilbert's murder, attempted murder, as well as drug dealing and gun possession. The other six members of the gang were convicted of various drug dealing and gun possession charges. Sentences for Amos and Joyce's lieutenants totaled a minimum of 146 years. Finally, Lee Amos was handed a minimum sentence of 35 years. And Colin Joyce was told he would spend at least the next 39 years of his life behind bars. I think the sentences that these individuals received just shows um, how, how seriously their, their offences and their criminality has been taken uh, by the judicial system. I mean, the fact that they've, they've both got longer uh, minimum recommendations than Peter Sutcliffe got is, says something. So long were the sentences that Greater Manchester Police went to extraordinary lengths to publicise them. Aging posters were made showing how Joyce and Amos could look at the end of their sentences and they were plastered on billboards all over the city. It was a defiant message to the community and to Manchester's criminal underworld that gangland behaviour would not be tolerated. Although the sentences were huge, they didn't bring an end to the suffering. They can still hold their brothers, their sons' hands, give them a kiss goodbye, see you tomorrow, see you next week. We can't do that. We have to kiss a headstone to give him a kiss. That's what hurts the most, that we have to come here to see my brother. Sometimes touch his picture and say, son, I love you and I miss you. Why do you leave me? The pain will always there, always, never leave me. This case was solved by a combination of innovative policing and good old-fashioned detective work. It took 11 dangerous men off the streets and it brought to an end a period of lawlessness which hopefully Manchester will never see again. Since the arrest and charge of Lee Amos, Colin Joyce and the rest of the gang, we've seen a significant reduction in the number of firearms incidents across Greater Manchester. Gun crime in the city has fallen by almost 60% in two years. For a 16-month period, there wasn't a single gang-related shooting. But for officers like Rod Carter, the fight goes on. We're on duty every evening of the week uh, and we've been dealing with any gang-related or firearms-related incidents that may occur throughout the evening. The Excalibur anti-gang unit, working with the help of the community, continues to tackle gang activity 
taking guns and drugs off the streets. It's definitely felt safer. It feels more united as a community now. The whole problem hasn't gone away. There's always younger boys that are going to want to fill their shoes. But there's definitely been a change. Despite all the negative press mentions received over the years, uh, being referred to as Gunchester because of the gang violence, you can't forget that this is South Manchester, South Central LA, uh, and individuals such as Joyce and Amos come along very, very infrequently, uh, and I don't think the city's ever seen the likes of them before, and hopefully they won't again. In my opinion, Colin Joyce and Lee Amos had decided that they were now invincible. What we were able to show was that the community and the police together were a far bigger gang than their gang. Well, it's very, very hard and it is freezing, but they are battling on courageously. A few hiccups along the way, though. More from 71 degrees north tomorrow night at nine. We're back in Australia next, where Stephen Tompkinson is having a very exciting balloon adventure.